Spend money on something that is not bread. 
way. Satisfy your appetite with rich food. Turn your ear toward me and come to me. Listen so that you may continue to live. Yes, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The faithful mercies promised to David. Look, I appointed him as a witness for the peoples, a leader and commander of peoples. Look, you will call out to a nation you do not know, and a nation that does not know you will run to you. On account of the Lord your God, because of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. We continue now as we sing Psalm 42 and 43, response for it.
story that happens at a shifting, at, at, at shifting time in Jesus' ministry. A little over a year, and now the crowds are going to turn against him. But interestingly enough, the transition starts happening in this great and familiar miracle where we see the Lord's providence, what is important to him, and what becomes important to us. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to a, to a boat, there in a boat, to a deserted place, being alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. When evening came, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into, village, into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to him, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They told him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. Bring them here to me, he replied. Then he instructed the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. After looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave the food to the people. They all ate and were filled. They picked up twelve basketfuls of what was left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about five thousand men, not even counting the women and children. The Gospel of the Lord.
lesson about what it meant to live with and serve Christ. And the lesson here is not to stop being realistic, but instead to face a new reality that reality changes when you are in team, in harmony with Christ. It may have sounded completely absurd, impractical, unrealistic, but for anyone who actually knows Jesus, it was perfectly realistic for Jesus to tell the twelve, you, you give him something to eat. Talk about hands-on experience. This is as real and challenging as it gets, as they are facing this new reality. As I mentioned, this is a transition point in Jesus' ministry. He had spent a year down south with John the Baptist, um, and then he'd come up to Galilee, where he had worked for another year or so, and it had become tremendously popular, and then John the Baptist was killed. John the Baptist was gone, and now things were going to change. And the disciples needed to become acquainted with Christ's mission in a very, very special way and also understand what resources realistically were at their command. Now, this is a well-known miracle. We've heard this story, we're familiar with this story. We hear it again and again from the time we were children in Sunday school. But it's not just a neat story about an impressive miracle. There's always a lesson. Jesus' miracles had a purpose of teaching his disciples, certain facts and realities above himself, about ourselves, about life in the kingdom of God. What was Jesus accomplishing with this miracle of a number of different things? But specifically as we focus on how the disciples saw this miracle, he is teaching them again to examine their heart, to examine their priorities, and understand a few things that will be key to their role in the kingdom of Jesus. And it all comes down to kind of a, you know, putting the, 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 the EKG here on their heart. They're faced with a situation and Jesus is having them see reaction. And to learn something from that reaction. They are all looking at the same crowd. 12 men plus Jesus. They're looking across at this crowd that Jesus has been performing miracles and preaching, teaching, and so forth, but their reactions are very different. The disciples, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. We have a problem, Lord. They looked at the crowd and they saw a problem. Jesus was going to shape that because Jesus looked at the very same group of people and something very different was happening in his heart. Matthew describes it this way. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw a large crowd and he didn't say, oh my, we need to be fed, they should go, go home. No. Jesus saw the large crowd and he had compassion, <clears throat> compassion on them. How can you look at the same situation and have two such different reactions. It comes down to something that the disciples would learn, and that was how to rise, raise their priorities and become Christ-like in their way of thinking, which was not just a matter of, oh, okay. It was a matter of a complete change of heart, really. Now, Christ's heart was always the right place, being the Holy Son of God, and his number one priority was always the unblinking devotion to the salvation of mankind. And to see those people was to see not just a big group of people, but thousands of individuals. That he had come to earth, humiliated himself, and then in a couple of years, he would go and suffer the pains of hell in their place. This is what Jesus saw when he looked at this crowd. But that's fairly remarkable when you take the human side of things because Jesus had every reason to be thinking about other things. His good friend, his cousin, his forerunner, the second Elijah, John the Baptist, brutally murdered by her. Head on a fire. That was, th this was disturbing. And you can uh, imagine that, that this had to tear at Jesus' heart. 
Yeah, he was human, but yeah, he was fully divine and perfect, but his heart still knew the pain of what happened when people died, especially to die so unjustly. A time when Jesus probably would have preferred to be alone, to be alone in prayer with his father, to maybe calibrate a bit. And then this group of people comes in. Now, Jesus was perfectly willing and had done many miracles, cast out demons, healed, did all of these wonderful things because he wanted to. And the reaction of the people was so crass. Instead of saying, didn't Isaiah the prophet say that when the Messiah came, he would do these great wonders? Instead they came to see magic trip, tricks and get freebies. We know that more at the end of this miracle, but they came just to see miracles. John points that out when he records the same miracle. He says, they just came to see the tricks. And afterwards, when Jesus goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they try to force him, to take him by force, to make him their king. Why? Oh, my word. We want the free stuff, right? Give us the handouts. So, you got the grief of losing one of the most important people in Jesus' human life. You had the false and crass motives of the people who had come to see him. He had every justification to just leave. But he didn't. He stayed. He stayed not because of obligation, not because of fear, not because he'd been captured. He stayed. He saw a large, large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. He wanted to. His heart said, I want to be here. I want to serve these people as unworthy as they might be. Jesus knew what he had come to do. He had come to save those souls. He wanted to do it more than anything else. And the same one who would feed bodies, more important, would do what Isaiah described to take the souls, right? The longer he could keep that crowd there, the more he could teach. The more the gospel message could penetrate their hearts. Maybe change some of those crass priorities. But one way or another, all he wanted was time with these people. Time to share. Time to show. Time to comfort. Time to create and strengthen faith. And that's why he would say to the disciples, I told you to go away. Like the opposite. Let's not waste a minute that I might have during my short life here on earth to bring these people into the kingdom of God. And nothing was going to disrupt, nothing was going to distract. Not the devil, not the people, not even the threat of hell itself, and certainly not the evil of the food. Nothing would get in the way of Jesus, his ministry. His mission. And this was the focus and commitment that was still being built in the trial. They'd been with him for a while at this point. But there was still a necessity for growth here. There was still a necessity for them to recalibrate and find the commitment and drive that Jesus had and that they Lacked. This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the crowns away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Now, at, at, at first base, we say that's just a realistic comment, but it's not a realistic comment, only in the sense of that it matches human reason. And human reason by itself is entirely corrupt and godless. It draws conclusions, but those conclusions are many times just simply wrong because it's not guided by the Spirit. Reason without the Spirit separates us from God. But the new man, created by the Spirit through the Gospel, will turn that reason around and see 
reality in a whole new light. With the old man speaking in their heart, it was easy for them to look at this and say, not just that, wow, this is really difficult, but frankly, I'm pretty sure they weren't all that interested in solving this problem. It was pretty much a good excuse to get rid of them because after all, they got to spend all their time with Jesus. Why should they share it with anyone else? A hurt problem. How is Jesus going to change that? Chew them out? Punish them and give them leprosy? Whatever? No. He, it was the gospel. The good news of Jesus. And, and, and you don't have to see words here. What you see is Jesus himself is the living gospel. What they would see in Jesus at this moment was divine love. Divine commitment. They would see the gospel in the person of Jesus, in the way that he responded to this situation that would cause their hearts to change, that would cause their faith to grow, that would cause their mind to be sanctified by the power of the Spirit and be brought into the line with Jesus, not by force, not by law, not by guilt, but by the transforming power of God to change what is sinful, earthly, and selfish into a mind that shares the mind of Christ. What an opportunity. This might have been a reaction that would have delighted Jesus at this moment. Is that he's looking at 10, 12, 15,000 people. It's getting to be late and the people are hungry. And the disciples would come to Jesus and say, Lord, is there somebody we can keep them here? We don't want to miss this opportunity. We've never seen such a large crowd. We need the extra time with them. That would have been what delighted Jesus. And this is where Jesus would take them and increase their faith. In Christ's kingdom, before deciding reality, what reality is, but let's sort out our own hearts. Before we decide what is possible or impossible, what we should do or what we're really not interested in, think about who's doing the talking in that mind and in your heart. Is it your selfish, sinful nature or is it the mind of Christ that the Spirit has given you at your baptism and reinforces at the table and strengthens and instructs through the guidance of God's Word? What voice? is speaking as we evaluate what our reality actually is. Don't let the old man fool you and don't make excuses about, well, it just seemed reasonable because what is reasonable in the kingdom of God is very different. The Lord has fed you and like the twelve, he is shaping you, causing you to rethink the way that we approach life, especially the way that we approach our discipleship in the kingdom of God. We are here in a wonderful congregation full of good people. The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful place to worship, to gather around His Word. And our mission is out there. Yeah, we are here to support this family of faith. But that's not where it stops, is it? That would be good to want to be fed by the Lord. Good to build our community here at Zion, but it still would not be the full vision of Jesus, who is still looking outside of the lost souls. We have to ask ourselves: Is our reality getting in the way? It's not difficult what to figure out what Jesus wants, but it's really easy to stop and listen to God. You know, we're, we're not that big of a group, and we're all kind of getting old. We don't have the young families. We're already taking these members, and we're burning them out because our few members have to do a lot of stuff because we don't have a lot of people to share. And, and so, Lord, I, I, I guess there's only so much we can do. It sounds a little bit like those guys at the Sea of Galaxy. Yeah, we know what you want. Discipleship, the heart of Christ, causes us to say, Trinity. We have been given a few decades 
to live on this earth. We've been given a group of people. We've been given the gospel message. And we've been placed in our own mission field here. We would delight the Lord to hear God's people and saints. What a chance. Let's not waste a moment. Let's not waste an opportunity. Let's not forget that for the time and in this place, the Lord has put us here. Let's take advantage of the opportunity and share the mission that we've been given. Because after all, the Lord has chosen you, like He did the Twelve, to be part of the greatest cause in all of mankind, the deliverance of souls from punishment and hell, from an eternal separation from God and all that is good, we have the chance to make that difference. And the kingdom of God and its extension is the only reason that God allowed the sun to rise today and end it all because he's not done. As long as he's not done, we're not done yet. Okay. You give them something to eat. That's really simple. Don't, no ambiguity whatsoever in what Jesus told the twelve to do. The interesting thing is he told them to do it. Well, they been witnessing all the miracles and, and all this stuff, and suddenly Jesus turns to them, they present this enormous challenge, and Jesus said, go ahead and give some meat. Now that's interesting. Because now they were going to have to confront another reality, and that is, what are the real resources at their disposal? They knew the job, the task. They knew it broadly, they knew it narrowly. In this case, what did Jesus want them to do? Now they had to consider, what were the realistic resources at their disposal? Hopefully, Jesus through his wonderful example of the living gospel right before their eyes, their, their hearts have been changed. Maybe they were beginning to feel the compassion because the Spirit was working that compassion in them. But now at this point, they say, we want to, but how? How do we do what we want to do? You have to correct another problem, not just the motive, but the weak faith that doesn't see the reality of the solution here. Give them something to eat. It's Andrew, we're told. John uh, contributes more information about this little discussion that took place. It is Andrew, the, bro the brother of Simon Peter, who says, well, we have these uh, uh, these five barley loaves and two fish, and then, and he said, Andrew, put it here, right there. Stop. But he doesn't. He says, well, what's that? So many, it's like anywhere has to be better. But he was right. All they had was some a little bit of fish and bread that a boy had in his basket. Think about as you go about a project and you know you, you put up a spreadsheet, you put out the costs, you put out the supplies. Get all planned out. Well, that's been stewardship, isn't it? You don't just plunge into a project without planning, considering all the costs and the resources, and how those resources are going to be marshaled in the interest of a project. That's just common sense. So, we have the 12. Now, another thing John had uh, told about earlier, um, when he recorded this, was that previously, earlier in the day, when the crowds were so gathered around Jesus, Jesus had already told Philip, you guys are going to have to give him something to eat later. So this wasn't the first time this idea had come up. This had been percolating, percolating uh, up among the group during the time. But now when it came time for the decision, they're evaluating the spreadsheet. They're looking at the plus and minus. They're looking at the bottom line and saying, no can do. Well, you know that when you're working the spreadsheet, if you live leave a figure out that's going to skew the whole thing. What was missing from Andrew's spreadsheet? Let's see. Fish, bread, people, 
truly biggest and most important factor that stood right before them, the man who was talking to them. What had they seen before? Generosity and power. Okay, for the time that they'd spent with Jesus, which was over a year at this point, what did they see? Generosity and power. How much Jesus loved people and the incredible power he had to do incredible things. All right, that was no secret. They had seen it again and again and again. But the most important thing that they had seen in Jesus was that generosity. How much he loved to do things for people. And it wasn't just words. If the one who came here to give body and soul for the obedience required of mankind so that it would stand on our account, as you stand before God at Judgment Day, the day that you die, what will God see? The, the, the generous gift of Christ who gave everything so that you could be considered righteous in the eyes of God. And then took you, your real life, your sins, your flaws, and took them into the depths of hell for those hours on the cross where God forsook you. The one who would pay the greatest price, the infinite price. Could anyone look at Jesus and actually know him, having heard his word and seen his examples, and not say, I think Jesus can handle this. If he could save eight billion and counting, could he feed a couple thousand people some bread and fish? That's realistic. Jesus reacts in love.
into trust. We can learn the hard way or the easy way. The hard way is to struggle with our deficiencies and look at what we have and say, yeah, what is that? Or we can learn the easy way and let the Spirit just let that faith speak and grasp the promises. Go and do what Jesus clearly wants us to go and do and know that Jesus will always be behind it. Can the maker of heaven and earth supply our needs? Would he ever abandon us? Does Christ love this congregation any less than those thousands on the Sea of Galilee? Does Jesus trust us any less than the twelve on the Sea of Galilee? Or does Jesus still speak to the members and friends of Zion and say, give them something to eat? Sometimes, you know, we, we wish we could have seen some of these really dramatic miracles. Boy, we really boost our morale, wouldn't it? The fact is that your sinful man always wants proof it can't find and will always deny. Your new man doesn't need proof at all because it is born of the Spirit and strengthened by the Gospel. And God forgives us our failures, our weakness, our short sightedness, and our selfishness. and makes us something that we are not. And so we rejoice in the work. We gather the fish, we gather the loaves, we offer them to the Lord and say, here, and then we can marvel at the results the Lord will always produce. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and giving you and Christ, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join now in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of unbeing. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became holy with him. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. In his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation, the bounties of the earth, the joy of life, and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts, and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly fruit. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us. 
to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember and mercy those who are sick and suffering, and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Bless and pray for those in need, and to help them with deeds of kindness. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you sustain your servants, Pat and Shelley uh, Reynolds, for decades of their very life. We ask you to continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and their Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises, and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our own private petition. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on our prayer as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the rest of the kingdom and the power of your glory.
so that all who have received in his body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and 